This morning, as we transition to, or before we transition to the sermon, I do want to make um, one announcement for everybody, and that is um, a sad announcement for us, but um, positive for um, Wendy and her husband. So um, many of you know um, JT and Wendy. I'm pointing to JT. Um, he's out here today. Um, JT and Wendy. JT is the other person who joined the church that rivaled for my name, um, JT. People call me JT. So um, I, t- I said on that day that he joined that he had to go, um, and I wasn't serious, um, but um, all these months now, you have been with us for like two Easter's about now. So they've been um, with us for a while. But um, JT and Wendy have, are having to move away uh, or have chosen to move away um, for different employment opportunities. So they're moving back to JT's home in Georgia um, where he's going to work there. And he's already there, which is why he hasn't been here the most recent weeks because he's already started a new job. So we just um, ask for um, prayers of uh, transition and blessings for JT and Wendy. And we're so grateful that we've been able to spend these years with them. So um, just as a, as a side note, we all, um, she's not here today, unfortunately, but um, Betty Burroughs um, is a, a member of our church who's a great fisher for people. Amen? Everywhere she goes, she's telling people about God and about our church. And so JT reached out, or Betty reached out to JT and Wendy, and that's how they knew about Sam Lando. So we're just so grateful when um, our, our church family is bold to tell people about their faith and about their church home. So you will be missed, and um, you're welcome to keep in touch. So Today, um, we continue in our sermon series, um, which is called A Canvas of Grace. And in this series, we've been going through the pictures, the stained glass that is represented in the top of our sanctuary space. And we started many weeks ago now, all the way on the left side with the story of Adam and Eve. And today, we come to the picture which you see on the screens, which is at the far right, the end of the right chancel nave wall here. And this is a picture that represents a very well-known story. Um, you can see um, the Jesus, the Christ character, is the man in the back with the halo affixed to his head. So that's how you know um, that they're talking about Christ in, in iconography. That's Jesus. And in front of him are two of his disciples. And if you'll look down to what they're doing, you can see their arms and their hands. And they're reeling in a net full of fishes, fish. So see Jesus the disciples and the fish. It takes a while. Um, the story um, represents, the, um, the picture represents the story that's told in the Gospels of when Jesus advises his disciples where to cast their net to be successful in fishing. Today I'm preaching it from the Gospel of John chapter 21. And if, if, um, if perhaps by chance in, uh, any of my sermons are memorable to you, um, you may remember that I preached from this same passage the third Sunday after Easter this year. This is a common story that comes up after Easter. And so given um, the Hurricane Dorian closures and all that stuff, I thought, "Ah, maybe I should just, you know, open that Word document on my computer and brush off a few illustrations and give you the same sermon. But I want everyone on Staff Parish Relations Committee to know that I did not do that, all right? I wrote an entirely new sermon for today, the same scripture You get the scripture twice this year. Um, Before I read the scripture, I want to share with you um, the direction I'm taking on it, Um, which is that today, uh, well, not just today, but in this week as I prepared the sermon, um, what kind of God has put on my heart with this scripture has been to talk about work, W-O-R-K. Work, um, the word, is not mentioned in this passage at all. Um, but, of course, people talk to me about their work, and I live in a household that both works, and we talk about work a lot. And as I read the passage all week, what kept coming to my mind was the work that we do. Work is not just things that are paid, of course. Most of us are familiar with working to earn a living, but work is all the regular, ordinary things that we fill our daily lives with because we have to, because we need to. Uh, it's working around the home, taking care of children, loved ones, it's our volunteering, it's our work. We all have some sort of work. You can follow along, Gospel of John, chapter 21, verses 1 through 14. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, which is the Sea of Galilee. And he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. Here's where the work comes in. 
They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them, and though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Let us pray. Gracious God, in this time, I ask that I be made small so that your truth is great, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts Be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, I titled today's message BYOF, which in my language today stands for Bring Your Own Fish. BYOF, Bring Your Own Fish. Now, when I was a a, a naive, very innocent kid growing up in middle school, in parts of high school, um, I would go to youth group where we had BYOF parties, which of course meant bring your own food. Then as I got a little bit more, um, you know, mature, um, I recognized um, other types of parties that were called BYOB parties, all right? Um, You know what those are, bring your own... I see where some of us are this morning. Um, Father, help us. Okay. Yes, they were the BYOB, bring your own beverage parties. Today, Jesus is having a BYOF party. Bring your own fish. We're talking about work today. Um, Work is not just what you do to earn a living. It's not just what you do to acquire money. um, But work is what you do in your ordinary, everyday life. Um, The work of keeping house, the work of taking care of children, the work of taking care of those in your life, your relatives or loved ones that are infirmed. Um, Work is your volunteering. Work is what you do um, to fill your day. It's purposeful, and it's meant to be productive. It's meant to be fruitful. God in this story appears to workers. Now, uh, Jesus did not appear to the disciples who were doing nothing. There are seven disciples in this story. We don't know where the rest of them are. Maybe they had something else to do. But if we think about all of the disciples, all 12, Jesus found them while they were working. We are meant to do something with our lives. We're meant to work. This is a BYOF world. We have to bear fruit. Um, When I talk to people in my life and and when I talk to people in in, in my counseling ministry, um, there are um, kind of a a top two thing that we're going to talk about no matter what. Um, The top one thing that everybody wants to talk about right away is their family and um, their significant relationships. So people come and they talk about their relationships and what's wrong with their relationships. And um, in our lives, um, 
Relationships have the great opportunity to provide us joy and lots of privileges and excitement, and relationships also have the ability to cause us lots of stress and tension and anxiety. The second thing that people want to talk to me about, and probably you'll know in your relationships with people, the second thing that people want to talk about is their work. Whether it's their work or their spouse's work or their children's work, the second thing that comes to our mind in a conversation is, hey, Dewey, how are the kids? How's work? It's a, how's your honey, and how's your money? <laughs> Relationships and work. They both have the opportunity to bless us immensely, and they both have the opportunity to really cause us lots of tension and anxiety. And yet, the disciples are found working today. This was probably a very anticlimactic thing for Peter to be doing. He had followed Jesus. He had given up three years of his own work as a fisherman to follow God and become close to him. And now the adventuresome life with Jesus is gone because Jesus has suddenly disappeared just as mysteriously as he came. Peter and the disciples may well have been feeling that they were left in the lurch and not knowing what to do. And with Peter in particular, he probably had many thoughts, regrets, and resentment of himself because he had a lot of unreconciled business with Jesus. Remember, Peter denied the Lord three times. Now where was he, and what is he meant to do now? I know in my um, moments of anxiety and tension, if tension ever comes into the household, which of course it does, I go to work. Maybe many of you are the same. Maybe your work is not the office, maybe it's doing something outside, or maybe it's playing pool or, or going to hang out with a friend, but we all have something we do to escape the tension. And today, Peter goes to work. Now, I want to draw a distinction that's really not relevant to the sermon, but it's an important thing to say, which is that nobody's work is more important than their marriage. Nobody's work is more important than their children. And nobody's work is more important than their health. But yet we oftentimes throw ourselves into our work so that we can avoid the other real problems that we have. When I was a, a kid growing up, um, I, I, I talked about this before, I liked to mow. I mowed all the time and we had a riding lawnmower and lived on a farm and had a massive yard. And so I mowed constantly. And um, mowing was my trick to get out of any tension in the house. So if I had a disagreement with my mom or my dad or my older sister was getting on my nerves, I went outside to mow, uh, assuming that it wasn't snowing. <laughs> I went outside to mow and... Um, it's something you can think that always needs done, but in the late parts of the summer in Kansas, it gets so dry that the grass really doesn't grow, but I would go out and mow it anyway, kicking up dust, trying to escape, and I would think that that would kind of make me to feel better, but as I rode the lawnmower and just hovered there to the, to the hum of the engine, my tension just increased because I was just thinking of all the things I should have said, Right? And thinking of how I was right and they were wrong. And when I get home, they're really going to get it. I'm going to formulate my argument now. And so as blood pressures and tempers rose, while I thought I was trying to solve the problem, my body was telling me that the problem was not outside of me, but it was inside. And there was a, a hole. There was a riff in a relationship that needed to be repaired. Work could not do it. So Mr. Millionaire, Mrs. Millionaire, or Mrs. Billionaire out there, your work is not going to solve your problem. Your work is just something you have to do to get by in this life. Adam and Eve, through their sin, put us in a situation where Scripture tells us that now man and woman will toil on this earth. And so we work. And the hole in Peter's heart and in, in, in the gap between the disciples' um, feeling like they were in God's will and yet feeling abandoned, in that devastated space, the disciples did something that most of us would do. They went back to work. Monday morning came. They, like us, had celebrated the resurrection on Easter Sunday, but then Easter morning, Easter Monday comes. And they had to go back to the ordinary. They were fishermen, 
and they were professional fishermen. And they knew exactly what they were doing when it came to fishing, and so they wanted to go do something that they were good at. And so they went out at night because logic and experience had taught them that nighttime was the most productive time to go fishing. But on this occasion, they had fished all night without a singular trace of success. Which, when you think about it, is very frustrating, but um, it, it, it's the reality, isn't it? Because what happened was their inside was hollow and didn't see a future, and they did not know what to do. They were empty. And so their outside actions produced the result of their inward life. So being empty inside and feeling this massive gap, as soon as they went to work, they produced a net that was empty. So that even a stranger looking at them from a far distance could see the truth about them. That there was a hole that only God could fill. Um, there's a phrase um, that is told to us young professionals, which is that you know that you're a success in your work life when you have no personal life. <laughs> but even the people that you work with can see from a distance, even if they're total strangers to your spirit, they can see if you have invested your life in something outside of yourself so much that you haven't taken care of the whole inside. So, offended, I'm sure, but when this stranger called out to the disciples on their boat, saying, you have no fish, do you? They humbly said, no. It's pretty obvious. Um, we oftentimes uh, use our work or our outside the house obligations um, as a way to fulfill the needs in our lives that they cannot fulfill. Your work will not be there for you on your deathbed. Hopefully, your spouse will. Your work will not be writing you nice cards 15 to 20 years after you've retired. But hopefully your children will come visit you. Work is one thing, but your connection with the spiritual has to come first. So um, even the disciples on their boat are so desperate um, for some success in their life that they listen to the words of what they thought was a total stranger. When he said, cast your net on the other side of the boat. Um, you see, as Christians, we have the opportunity to understand that there are people, and in this story, it is Jesus. There are people, there are messengers, there are angels, and there is Christ Jesus himself who sits at a distance from what we think our problems are, and he sees them from a different perspective. When you're on the boat and you've got no fish, doing everything you thought could bring up fish, all you say is, woe is me, something must be wrong with the lake, right? Something must be wrong with the net, right? Something must be wrong with my coworkers, right? And we blame, 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 blame. Well, if my boss would just listen to me, if my spouse would just respect me, if my children would just listen to what I'm saying to them, blame, blame, blame. But one came standing from afar who looked at the lake, and from where he was standing, he could see something that you could not see. And he gave you his advice. I know that um, there are people in our congregation that are struggling with unemployment. And I want you to know that as a Christian, you have the transformative edge on that. 
you can trust that Christ Jesus is looking at your situation and he is seeing it from a different perspective. Listen to his advice. I know that there are parents in our congregation who are desperately doing everything they can to keep their children in rehab and off drugs and alcohol. And though at times it seems like one wild night or bad choice wrecks the entire progress, you can be reminded today that Jesus sees your situation from another perspective. And he asks you to listen to his advice. There is the workplace rift you're going to walk back into tomorrow morning where even though you've agreed upon something with your team, people will try to take it in a different direction. And you'll feel alone like your net is empty. Listen to Jesus' advice because he sees your problem from a different perspective. I know there is the home in this congregation that is filled with crisis and disharmony and arguing. And tonight you'll go to bed thinking that you pulled up another empty net. Listen to Jesus and to his advice because he sees your household from a vantage point that you cannot see. Now, this is still a bring-your-own-fish world. Jesus did not observe the frustration of the disciples on the boat and say, well, you have no fish, do you? That is so sad. I'm just going to get in the water, swim out there, and find some for you, and I'm going to bring you on in. Don't worry. He didn't do that. He didn't say, oh, I'm going to quit my job because I don't get my way. He didn't say when things were unpleasant, I'm going to think about how early I can retire. He didn't say I'm going to walk out on my family because they disagree with me. He didn't say I'm going to quit volunteering there because that other person is so yappy and gossipy I just can't stand it. He didn't say that. He knew that the disciples were where they were for a reason so that they could learn to listen to his voice from afar. If you don't listen to someone from a distance, why are you going to listen to them up close? And he told them to cast their net in a different direction. And then he said, haul your fish in. Bring your own fish. Work. And then when they got to the shore, even though Jesus already had a piece of fish on his charcoal... What did he say to the disciples? Bring me some of your fish. My friends, our God wants us to be successful. He wants us to be fruitful. He wants us to have an abundance of what we need. Those things as an end are not our problem. He has planned to give us those things. What he needs for us to do in our spiritual life is to listen to his voice. Because in listening to his voice, that is where the fruitfulness is. Bring your own fish, Don. Because Jesus needs it. He could bring it in himself but he is living his life with you so that you understand just like the disciples did that their real job was not a firefighter or a nurse or a teacher or a lawyer or a construction worker or a fisherman. Their real job was to learn to fish for people. So maybe today we take some advice from Jesus fishermen or we take them from our own fishermen like Betty who bring people all the time. But bring your own fish, not only to take care of yourself in this world, but bring your own fish to God so that you show that you trust the knowledge of his kingdom.